A just energy transition is taking center stage in the most radical global transformation of the energy system in decades. Now, this transition is particularly relevant in Africa, where the continent grapples with the challenges of alleviating energy poverty amidst a rapidly growing population projected to hit at least 2.4 billion by 2050. This is exerting pressure on existing energy resources. The challenges facing Africa's oil and gas sector as the world accelerates its transition away from fossil fuels are significant. Today on NC Exclusive, my guest is Mr. N.J. Ayuk. He's a Cameroonian attorney, author, and businessman. He is also the executive chairman of the African Energy Chamber. So, Mr. Ayuk, let's start with this energy transition conversation. So, we've seen the moves that the West is making towards an energy transition. But there are concerns as to what this trajectory means for the African continent. And I think it's the African Development Bank president, Dr. Akimumi Adishina, that's put it best in recent times that Africa deserves a just energy transition. So starting from there, what does this just energy transition look like? I think you look at a just energy transition for Africa, you have to think, put everything in context. Mm -hmm. 600 million Africans don't have access to electricity. 900 million Africans don't have access to clean cooking technologies, most of them women. That is a problem we have in Africa right now. And if you're going to transition into cleaner forms of energy, we need to have energy for those that don't have it now. But also we need to pay attention to a growing Africa, younger, bigger population. And also what is important also is to, to, to say, are we moving away from fossil fuels at a time when Africa really needs fossil fuels to close government budgets, mm -hmm. to build roads, bridges, schools, and also be able to drive itself up? And for most Africans, you cannot have a just energy transition when wealthy nations have been able to use fossil fuels to drive up human flourishing, develop the economies, build some of the best things that we all are envious of, and then today they turn around and tell Africans, time is up, mm. time is up. There has to be some kind of justice in this transition. And sometimes just let Africans make their own choices. They are smart enough, they are well atoned. We have our problems, but let us make our choices. That's what you need. That's how you get to a just energy transition. So I, I like the last parts of your answer there because that's been a major sticking point for many people. We had the first, the second, and the third industrial revolution. Western countries, particularly when you look at the uh, at the U.S., they use the second and the third industrial revolution, steam powered engines, and being able to move cross country to develop their economy. But now we're in the middle of a crisis that African countries did not contribute to, and we're being told to use to leave those same natural resources in the ground because the world is moving away. Is that a fair conversation? Because it's a conversation about balancing the world's needs, but also the needs of the African continent as well. Absolutely, it's not a fair conversation. Africa's greenhouse gas emission are 2.73%. If you take out South Africa and Egypt, it's 0.5%. So you can't tell somebody that has not done this damage to be the person paying reparations for the damage. The Paris Accords, as it, as it was done, it never came out to say, we need to stop using natural gas. But post Paris, the promises made to Africans were not kept. And today you're still telling these people that, well, you know, we've made a lot of promises to you. We never kept the promise, but you need to abandon your resources. There is abundant natural gas in Africa abundant crude oil in Africa. And Africans have to keep using that, those resources at the same time while embracing renewables and driving that um, low carbon economy. But it is a little bit hypocritical. I was at COP26 and after COP26 in Glasgow, all the promises were made. But then what happened three months later, Norway gave out 52 oil licenses. The UK put out 240 licenses for drilling. The US opened all federal lands for more drilling, and then Germany started to went back to coal, and Poland and Holland were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then you turn to Africans and say, well, leave it in the ground. Mozambique could go from zero to the third largest producer of natural gas in the world. 
But that country is still poor with no industrialization. And you tell them, just leave it in the ground. We need to understand that this is not all about exporting. We've made our mistakes in the past, but we need to be able to use natural gas to power Africa, to drive up industries so that we can create urea, ammonia, NPK fertilizer plants. So we don't have to go to Russia and Ukraine and beg for food. We can grow that food right here in Africa. We sit in Africa's most industrialized country, South Africa. It is eight to 10 hours a day in the dark. Eight to 10 hours a day in the dark. That is unfair. That is not just. We need to be able to, to still drive that. While, we, while we're still at that, a lot of the, wealth, the wealthy countries that are saying, we need to abandon all these oil, these, these oil resources because we're going to have stranded assets. I'm not so worried about stranded assets. I'm worried about stranded lives. And those stranded lives are everyday Africans trying to cross the Mediterranean to go look for green pastures in Europe because they cannot afford to have a job opportunity right here in Africa. We need to be able to create opportunities right here in Africa. If we do that, then you start seeing those, that, that just energy transition. But also, we're going to have to do this ourselves mm. because they promised us $100 billion right after um, the, um, Kyoto, in the, in the, the um, Kyoto. It's been 13 years. They have not paid a single dime of it. So you make promises you don't keep. The, 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 the promises. How do you expect these countries to deal with adaptation and mitigation on, on climate? So you left on your own. And I always say, you know, I watch Nollywood and I watch Hollywood, but, you know, Superman is not coming. <laughs> Batman is not coming. Wakanda Forever is a good movie, but the Black Panther is not coming. We as Africans have to be able to deal with financial solutions to really drive up our own energy transition and on our own timeline. We're going to get to that uh, as we get further in this conversation. So you did mention natural gas as well uh, as oil. So let's give some of the numbers. Africa holds around 13% of the world's natural gas and 7% of oil, but has the world's lowest per capita energy use. And then when it comes to this energy transition conversation, in a strange way, you have the oil industry, the fossil fuel industry, championing Africa's right to continue to use natural resources. But then you have climate change experts who say at the end of the day, uh, African countries like Nigeria, unfortunately, which have large fossil fuel fuel reserves have ended up with corrupt politicians and it actually hasn't been used to alleviate poverty or even solve the energy uh, poverty situation. So it's the petrochemical, it's the petrodollars, it's the corruption with that. When we put all of that together, is there a middle ground to be found? Of course, there's a middle ground. The past is reference, not residence. Mm. If we are going to reside in like we are at the chamber, I've always said, we should not reside in the past of colonization. We should not reside in the past of slavery. If we have to go back, then we'll never be able to find solutions for the future. The future is this. We've seen an assortment of, you know, dictators, corrupt bandits that have really plundered Africa, both international and local. However, where we are today, we have to start addressing that. And to, to, to give more credit, a lot of African countries have taken steps where they have put in more regulations to really curb down on this, engage with the extractive industry transparency initiatives, but a lot more work has to be done. But this is really where you have to change your mindset and say, it's not about getting a lot more capital or getting a lot more money into government, which are struggling with governance issues. This is where you look at free markets limited government, individual liberty and pers personal responsibility, where we, we're driving up business, we're driving up money in the hands of everyday people. So you get to unleash the power of the continent. It's younger people, it's women, and seeing how this works. That's why the private sector is more important, because the private sector is able to take huge amounts of money, manage it, look at PL, balance things, and then drive even innovation and different things for the future, rather than having a lot of this money in the hands of politicians where it's only spend, 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 corrupt still, and you can't continue the same, the same strategy of the past into the future. We need to go on a correction course, but that doesn't mean that fossil fuels are bad. They have been examples across the world. There have been some examples in Africa where fossil fuels have been able to show a lot of development, create more jobs, 
pay some of their biggest taxes into government, but also create opportunities. I mean, let's take, for example, Nigeria. The fossil fuel industry has created more, more multimillionaires or billionaires than any industry in, 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 in that country. And you see that in, again in, in even other countries like Angola. Have there been mistakes? Of course they have been. But we should, it's about fix it, don't end it. Mm. And we also need to be futuristic. And we should not talk about the renewables. Well, let's talk about the, the, the um, renewable energy sector. $600 billion in green bonds, less than 2% went to the African continent. How is that just? How is that fair? But also, most of the renewables, you are not building the supply chains in Africa, so you're still encouraging a different kind of corruption where the, the critical minerals and metals, who is, to, who is, who is looking at the 14-year-old or 12-year-old girl that has to be um, in school, but, but it's, it's digging up mines for it to go to China and go to wealthy countries to bring us back the, 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 the solar panels. Don't you think we need to build that supply chain across Africa so that you can get the minerals in Africa, produce, mine it, process it, and build the solar panels or wind turbines and everything. But don't forget at the end of the day, it's not an addiction to fossil fuels. You need base load. You need base load and that base load energy for what we have right now you can only get it through natural gas or coal you could still say we can face down or face out coal but natural gas is still our best option for base load for base load energy and that's why you need to have to right now we need to see more pragmatism more common sense and more balance as we approach this you mentioned climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation earlier being futuristic. We're talking about the now for mm -hmm. millions of Africans right now. Where do we stand when it comes to climate change adaptation and mitigation in terms of the energy industry on the continent when we see these massive disasters that have claimed thousands of lives and displaced millions across the continent? It's called global warming, not Africa warming. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a global solution to this. And I'm not going to debate the stats, but if everything was based on climate and based on um, the stats that being thrown at us, if having 2.73% or 2.75% greenhouse gas emissions and going through that, Europe would be underwater right now because they are somewhere at between 14 to 17%. These African countries are paying the price for an issue that they, it's not of their making. That's why you need to get the wealthy countries, they need to decarbonize so African countries can industrialize. The real question is that those who have caused this damage, that we are being victims right now, they need to really deal with the climate, with the climate, with climate justice, they need to really deal with the, the actions. African countries are trying to come out of a recession from COVID. They're still not recovered from COVID where they couldn't have vaccines. They still, when, when, when the wealthy nations are having a recession, we having a depression. Mm -hmm. How do you expect these countries to be able to do the adaptation and mitigation and deal with some of these natural disasters that are happening that is not of their own making? It's not of their own making. And then if, if is the response to them is to say, well, you can't eat anymore. Before you're going to save the planet, you need to save some lives so you can save the planet. You can't starve yourself to death because you want to save the planet. That would be one of the most unreasonable things to do and it would be irrational. And I think it would actually be criminal. But we have to really put that focus and say, we need to also have an African strategy. An African strategy that deals with an African mitigation and adaptation. You can't tell me in a continent where we have $2.4 trillion of private capital, we cannot raise the capital to deal with these ourselves because what we've seen from the wealthy countries is that they're not, they're not pitching in, they're not coming. More money has gone into Ukraine than, than to Africa we, when, it comes, when it comes to climate issues. That is something that we have to know where we stand and we have to take that responsibility ourselves rather than waiting for somebody. You're not going to have to deal with climate issues because um, by aid, by waiting for, for handouts and development aid. We've seen what aid has done to the continent. So the cyclones and everything that we're facing, it's not of our own making. We are victims of that. Those that have caused the problem need to be able to repair and fix it. If our only way 
to get out of this, it's going to be using natural gas, then why not? Why not? If our only way to get out of this is going to be using coal, then why not? We are not going to abandon resources because we, because we we're waiting for some Messiah which is not coming. I think it's really, really important that we put balance to this because these African countries that are seeing these natural disasters, they should be asking those that cause the problem to compensate them. Where would you say Africa's energy sector is on the road to a just energy transition for the continent? Um, it's a lot of work. I think the IEA and many organizations that have really discussed this issue, I think they don't have an understanding of Africa. First of all, you say by 2035, 60 um, to 65 percent of cars driven in Africa would be electric vehicles. I mean, somebody doesn't have light and you're telling them about driving a Tesla. I think that's be, being very, very out of touch. We, we need to first get electricity before we start talking about having a Tesla because that stuff, would, that's, you would drive that stuff for two hours and you wouldn't be able to drive it anymore. So when you put that kind of stuff in a report and you try to drive that narrative, that tells me that you're out of touch with the continent. Our energy needs right now, some people say we need to spend a hundred billion dollars a year between now and 2040 to get to a just energy transition. I just wrote a book about it, that's wrong. We just a lot more. Africans do not just need electricity for, to light up their cell phones. Or, or to light up their houses or power their cell phones. They need electricity to drive industries, to create jobs, to create um, a lot of opportunities for themselves. And this is a chance for us to, uh, to, uh, to engage and bring in low carbon, um, um, low, low, low carbon solutions to this, but also at the same time, also be able to pay attention to the base load energy that is needed to be able to drive that. Our roadmap to adjust energy transition is going to be Gas, baby gas, we're going to have to drill for natural gas. When I say drill, baby, drill, sometimes people get offended, mm -hmm. but it's still going to be drill, baby, drill. You're going to drill for natural gas. You're going to use some oil to get to get there. And in some cases, you might going to have, have to use coal, but, but even though it's still being decommissioned right now, but you need to face, face, so find ways to face out coal. At the same pace, you need to fast track how you bring in renewables into our energy system while also embracing um, new new fuels like hydrogen fuels seeing how you could use hydrogen to really drive a hydrogen economy where you could still be able to replace to to take care of heavy industry we need like cement heavy industry it's our one of our biggest consumers cement we need to deal with that and we need to be able to drive that. I think there is a pathway, but it's going to be very expensive. Most people do not understand how expensive this is. It is going to be very expensive. And there is right now no pathway to financing Africa's transition. Hmm. You're not going to have this transition by just wishing. It's not wishful thinking. We need to, somebody has to pay for it. And are we going to tax Africans every day to pay for it? Are we going to increase pr um, um, prices at the pump every day to pay for it? Or are we going to tax everyday people that are working where we still have um, a, a huge amount of people without jobs? And so we need to bring it home. We need to narrow, we need to get out of the big IEA talk and the big uh, things and really see what do every people want, everyday people want. They just want to have a good, decent life where they have energy and they can raise their families. And if we're not meeting that, then we're failing. So when it comes to this issue of financing and, and closing that gap, are we looking at international partnerships? Are we looking at, what are we looking at? Because again, you also said earlier, there's no Black Panther coming to save us. There's nope. no Superman. And we can't wait for the West to give the handouts. What then is the solution? Where does the money come from? You can find the money within Africa, but we have to deal with our governance issues. Hmm. We have to look at the mirror. I mean, most of the time we say we just mirrored images, but mirrors are to correct what you see, not reflect what you see. We have been reflecting a lot about what we see. Our governance systems are really, really bad. We've done some improvements, but we need to hit it harder. We need to step it up because money goes well, it's where it's welcome. So it's whether it is African capital or international capital, we need to be able to have the right kind of tax environment where people can invest and know that the incentives, we need to be able to deal with corruption, 
transparency issues. We need to be able to deal with repatriation of funds. We need to be able to deal with so many ills that we continue to see. And these governance and above risk issues are really, really killing us. And that is the problem. And if we don't pay attention and really address these governance issues, then we're going to be in massive, in massive problems. Because whether it's an African hedge fund or an African private equity, they are not going to put money where they see the risk and the exposure is too high because we are not addressing that. But we also need to do the red tape issues and bureaucrats. And you want to launch a, get a project going, or you want to raise capital for a project going and stuff is documents are stuck with um, unelected bureaucrats sometimes. Civil servants. And what happens? It shouldn't take so long to approve a project than the time you need to build that project. But what is going on with bureaucrats holding everything behind? You're killing African ingenuity. You're killing innovation. You're killing entrepreneurship. And that's what's really going to drive it. Government is not going to be able to close this gap. It's everyday people. But government, but we need to deal with the governance issues. And I think Africans have to really ask themselves, do we want to move towards really establishing this or not? And this is not some Western um, plot against us. It's not some wealthy nations. It's what we are doing to ourselves. It's how we are addressing these issues. And we are not like we, we're not lacking of the skill set. We just don't have the political will to do that. And we are going to continue being stuck because of lack of political will and the gumption to say, let's drive this forward and really build this. So we can't deny the shifting strategies and the shifting dynamics across the world. And considering the fact that there's this global shift towards renewable energy, how do you see that impacting the oil and gas sector in Africa now? Are we already seeing a massive impact, whether it's divestment or in change in strategies? What are we seeing and how does that look going forward? Oil and gas is going to be around for at least the next 70 to 100 years. Okay. So that, that we, we need to take stock of that. But also oil and gas exploration in Africa I would say you have 10 to 15 years to explore because what is happening right now is that as shifting strategies, the IOCs, the international oil companies, they're moving from onshore, shallow water projects into deep water projects. They are going into those big, big ticket projects. And you're seeing that with new discoveries in Mozambique and Namibia, it's um, Senegal, um, potential LNG projects coming in. And also you're seeing that with uh, the Ivory Coast. But the dynamics are also that they want to explore better. They want to do it in a more environmentally friendly way and drive those technologies. And they're going to use carbon capture, um, um, carbon cap um, capture technologies to see how they can still drive that. But we in Africa have to be concerned about one thing. We are still the most unexplored and under, un underexplored um, 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 continent when it comes to our natural resources. So there's so many deals that are there waiting to explore Africa, to develop these resources that we are just not approving. That we, we need to see how that translates. But oil and gas has a future, but that future is only going to be determined by how we do it because we need to have a rise up of African independence. The Owandos, the Saharas, the Seplats, the Etio and Samoils. African independence is time for them to step up. I think that idea where you get your first million dollars as an African independent and you want to buy a private jet and you want to be on first class to Dubai, we need to cut some of that stuff out mm -hmm. and really be able to look at ourselves and say, we are the drivers of that African future. Because what if the IOC is tomorrow? And I ask this question, what if the IOC say we're diversing out of Africa? Who is going to run these this, this assets, who is going to acquire these assets? We need to be able to do that. But what if tomorrow you have a law, maybe in the European Union or in, in the United States, and they say, we're no longer going to accept crude oil or gas coming out of Africa. We don't have LNG receiving terminals. We don't have the refineries that can really refine our own crude and use it for our people. And we have not built pipelines to be able to connect Africa where we could be able to distribute natural gas, hydrogen, and be able to use that, that product in Africa. So we, would, we could be shut down in a minute. So we need to be very careful and we need to really be able to look at this and change our thinking a little bit. I always believe one thing, all Davids are good, but not all Goliaths are bad. 
So you got to find ways to bring some common sense and find a middle ground. And in Africa, we have to find middle ground because it's a big, massive continent. There is a continent, there is a country in East Africa like Kenya that is big on geothermal, 90% geothermal. You can't take an oil and gas narrative and think they need to adopt an oil and gas narrative. But also there is a country that is heavily dependent on oil and natural gas like Nigeria or Libya or um, Congo or Gabon. D very different way of thinking. There is a Mauritania or that relies a lot, massive desert, massive iron ore, they have a massive hydrogen potential. You have to find, you have to find that. So it's an energy mix. So Africa has to establish an African energy mix, not paid for by, a, a, by European organizations, but by African organizations. And has that energy mix and go with that plan because you are going to need natural gas in our energy system. You're going to need wind, you're going to need solar, but we, we should quit being very ideological about that. But you also need to be, know that we have a target. It's 1.5 degrees. We have to be part of that solution. And we should be looking at how do we operate in a low carbon economy while at the end of the day still providing for our people because they need to see the future. And that future is going to come with innovation, is going to come with us using different things. And so we don't want to be left behind. We want to be, we, I think we have a chance to also leapfrog. And that will be where we wrap things up. Mr. N.J. Ayuk, Executive Chairman of the African Energy Chamber, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me and thank you for coming to <laughs> Johannesburg, South Africa. It's an honor. It is. As the conversation around an energy transition for the world continues, demands are rising for a just energy transition for the African continent. And finding a sustainable way to meet the continent's energy needs is one of the development challenges of Africa. Besides that, decisions made today will shape the future of the continent's energy sector for decades to come. Thank you so much for joining me on this NC exclusive. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adileru Balogun. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every raise, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live.